Production funding for Arts Upload has been provided in part by Muriel McBrien Kaufman Foundation, Hall Family Foundation, The Hartwig Family, Francis Family Foundation, Richard J. Stern Foundation for the Arts, Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Randy Mason. And I'm Mara Sealy. Our show is called Arts Upload, and this week we're coming to you from Kansas City's Grand Old Music Hall. We've got the scoop on art boards and an author who put a pair of artists head to head. Plus some dancing with Bach and a special effects wizard. It's all ahead on the Upload. Most of the time, billboards either try to sell us something or point us towards something we might want to explore. But there's a pretty prominent one on Southwest Boulevard that doesn't really do either. It's the Crossroads Art Board making people say, hmm, <laughs> since 2008. <laughs> Producer Ashley Holcroft has more on the biggest canvas in town and the unusual way it came about. At first light on an early spring day, something is happening that has taken place for almost a decade. For three months, Deanna Skeetle's Dino Fear stood atop the Missouri Bank building. But today, it's being replaced by Rodolfo Marone III's creation. This now familiar visual spectacle wouldn't have been possible were it not for the presence of a uniquely artist-friendly bank looking for a new branch location. And we'd wanted to be down in the crossroads for a long time. We had a lot of customers down here. It was more convenient than for many of our customers than trying to weave their way to our downtown bank. So when a centrally located auto repair shop came on the market, the bankers jumped. And we actually bought it in a day. It's a really great location for us right in the center of the crossroads. And we were able to apply design standards by relying on our customer base, Helix and El Dorado in particular, who helped us really think outside the proverbial box around what a bank should look like. While that goal was fairly easy to achieve, there was just one problem. And when we bought it, it, had, it was kind of a consistent gun show, uh, auto show, billboard cycle. We were actually selfishly worried that a bank would put their ad above it, so we needed to gain, gain control of the billboards, so we immediately leased them. And then in the process of getting a, a semi-tax abatement on our property, we learned that they don't allow billboards on the properties. So we had to take the billboard down. Well, in the process of thinking about how to take the billboard down, we realized that, uh, that if we took it down, the building would fall down. So we had to get creative really quickly. And we uh, collectively decided that it would be uh, uh, really fun to have public art on our billboards. So this board went from being a load-bearing burden to shifting into lockstep with the Crossroads Art District, and all because of a special relationship with the Charlotte Street Foundation. We didn't know the first thing about curating art or art boards or artists in residence or any of that stuff. And they so clearly had a database of artists that we could use and a knowledge of the artists, a knowledge of their ability to actually perform on a project like this. And so it's, it's been a great partnership. For us, it was part of a strategic thing we were thinking about called Art Through Architecture, and it was an initiative that was kind of about um, commissions in public spaces. And it's really exciting for us to have that venue, that platform that is very public, but also really um, Charlotte Streety in its um, kind of unexpectedness. They've been making Kansas City Charlotte Streety for just shy of two decades clearing the path for hundreds of artists through an array of opportunities. An artist might come to us for a number of reasons. Um, they might come to us because they want some visibility. Uh, they actually might not know that that's why they're coming to us. <laughs> you know what I mean? Those opportunities can range from residencies to rocket grants. 
And even before joining Charlotte Street as the executive artistic director, Amy was certainly no stranger to the organization. In fact, she'd been awarded her own board in 2015. My board happened weirdly like right before I came into this job. It was an installation I'd done that I photographed. I think that it's one of those opportunities that, you know, when you get it, it's, I think it's one thing to, to know, oh, I've been selected for this thing. But again, like the, the minute that you drive downtown and you see it, huge in the middle of the real world, that is just, it's a very rare experience for an artist to have. I'd say it's really exciting, <laughs> actually. And at last count, we're at about 70-ish artists that have benefited or have had their artwork featured on the boards. Which brings us to the next art board recipient, Thayer Bray, whose work focuses on relational nuances. It's about uh, body dysmorphia. It's about perception, how in a relationship you idealize somebody or you um, just view them differently than they view themselves. And that's ironic when you consider how he thought his work would fare in the art board selection process. I had a friend, Rudolfo Meron. He was doing the application. He's like, just do it. I'm like, I don't know, I don't know. I'll just, I don't know if I'm good enough. He's like, shut up, you're good enough. Just do it, just do it, just do it. I'm like, okay, I'll just do it. Typed it up, I pressed send. I was immediately like, oh, I didn't get it. One or two months later, I just completely forgot about it. I was in the car and uh, Rudy called me. Um, he's like, hey man, did you check your email? I'm like, no, it's about the art board. He's like, don't make fun of me. And he's like, what? You got in? I'm like, don't make fun of me, man. I know I didn't get in. He's like, you got in. And I was like, what? I was very excited and um, pleasantly surprised. Of the approximately 60 submissions received each year during the open call, only eight are granted the honor of having their work on the board for three months. One of the key components to the selection process? We actually really try to diversify the art that's on the board and make sure that there's a real range in terms of um, the kind of work that's there, whether it's a drawing or a painting or a collage or a photo or a, a range in point of views. So we try to make sure that that board is something that's always changing, always feeling fresh. It's been really fun because we've learned that people from all over the city will, will make uh, trips down here to see what the new art boards look like. And we think it's really been fun for our brand and our culture to so purely do something that's good for the community that was not intended to benefit the bank initially. It has, in a second hand way, it's a nice that it benefits the bank and our brand but it's fun to do it because it's the right thing for the city, it's the right thing for the crossroads on Southwest Boulevard. If you haven't been to Union Station to catch the Da Vinci exhibit, well, your time's ticking down. It only runs through May 1st. Lots of drawings and models that attest to his genius, but you know the real life Leonardo has been fictionalized in a new book by Stephanie Story. It's called Oil and Marble, and in it, the St. Louis native imagines how two of the world's greatest artists might have shared the stage. I was walking through Florence with my husband in 2006. And I told him the story. The two most iconic works in all of Western history were created in the same town at the same time by two artists who hated each other. Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo were rivals. They really did live in Florence at the same time, during the same years, and they hated each other. And while they were living in that city, same town, same time, Leonardo was painting the Mona Lisa in oil, while Michelangelo was carving the David in marble. And he said, why does anybody know that? I don't know that, I'm a smart guy. And I don't realize they lived at the same time. Why don't you write that as a movie? Because at the time I was writing more screenplays. And so I went home and I started breaking the story. And even though I had been a fiction writer my whole life, it still frightened me to conquer this as a novel. But I set out to do that five years ago. The source of their rivalry was professional jealousy. They were also personality-wise at odds. Leonardo was handsome, popular, charming. At the time that they met, he was 50 years old, already at the pinnacle of his career. Michelangelo, on the other hand, was a loner, temperamental, socially awkward, and at the time when they met, 
Michelangelo was 25 years old. Not terribly well known yet. There's, in the actual historical record, there's a little bit of squishiness around how Michelangelo received the David Commission. People think that some other artists were competing for it, and Michelangelo was selected somehow, even though he was a lesser known artist. And there's a lot of speculation that Leonardo was up for the commission. Now, in my historical novel, Oil and Marble, I, of course, play that up and say Leonardo and Michelangelo went head to head for this competition, and Michelangelo won. There is a raw emotional power to Michelangelo that captivated me and I think made me understand something about the human struggle and the human spirit. When I look at the David, I see a guy facing down his opponent. I see a guy really in the middle of turmoil about to walk out into battle. And it gives me hope that maybe I can go conquer my own Goliaths or like Michelangelo did, maybe I can conquer a really botched block of stone to create a masterpiece. Leonardo da Vinci. I had a very hard time with Leonardo writing this book because I wanted to tell both sides of the story. The chapters bounce back and forth between Michelangelo and Leonardo. Michelangelo, Leonardo, Michelangelo, Leonardo. And I knew I needed to fall in love with Leonardo too, even though Michelangelo had lived in my head as a hero my entire life, so therefore Leonardo was of course always the villain. So I had to work to find him and to fall in love with him. And I did that by spending an inordinate amount of time in his notebooks and studying his paintings and really reading the things that he wrote and trying to get into his head. One of the things I love about Leonardo da Vinci is how his brain works, how he studied optics and biology, music and art, and combined them all to come up with these crazy inventions with scuba gear, tanks, multi-barrel cannons, so many flying machines. The man was really obsessed with flying. Early helicopters and gliders and airplanes, hundreds of years before any of these things were invented. Uh, but I, I, I really finally found Leonardo da Vinci when I started seeing him through the eyes of Lisa Garadini del Giacondo, AKA the Mona Lisa. And I still think if I had to have dinner with one of them, <laughs> Uh, Michelangelo is socially awkward. He doesn't like to talk to people. He's very temperamental. He tends to walk out on even popes. He might walk out on me. He doesn't bathe. Uh, Leonardo, on the other hand, wears perfume and likes to tell jokes and entertain people and tell great stories. And if I'm gonna have a conversation with one of them, I think I wanna have the conversation with Leonardo because his brain is brilliant, brilliant. There's a Leonardo da Vinci exhibit going on right now in Union Station. This exhibit does one of the best jobs I've ever seen of bringing Leonardo da Vinci to life as a human being. That it explores all of his thoughts, all of his heart, all of his art. It encapsulates him as a person. And I think too often times other exhibits and other places leave him as a legend leave him flattened out just as an artist or just as an engineer. And I think this exhibit does a really good job of bringing him to life as a person. You know, Union Station has about 20 years on this place. The music hall inside the municipal auditorium complex opened in 1936 during the Pendergast era. The Kansas City Philharmonic used to perform here, and these days it's still used by Theater League for some of its shows. Kinky Boots just finished her run, and the 2400-seat hall is often rented out for special events and performances. The interior has that great streamlined modern decor, and of course those light fixtures, Art Deco style, were actually the inspiration for the sky stations on top of Bartle Hall. It's also the home of the 1927 Robert Morton Theatre pipe organ, which reminds me of the Phantom of the Opera and kind of leads us to our next story. It's about an Ohio man who's making his mark in special effects, you know, designing, drawing, and sculpting. Ben Peter gives us a peek at his creative process, which yields some creepy results. I like to work with my hands as much as possible. My favorite thing to do is the sculpting aspect, building a character, and then seeing it come to life as you work on it's one of my favorite things. 
I was watching a TV show um, and saw a guy named Ray Villafane, and he was carving pumpkins. And I figured if he could do it, you know, it looks pretty simple. I could probably do it too. I would probably buy three pumpkins a week and just try and do what I could with them. I wanted to try and make my pumpkins look more realistic. And so I went to cinema makeup school to try and figure out the symmetry of the nose and the face and the eyes and the lips and kind of got sucked into the industry from there. For being a special effects artist, um, you really are a multimedia artist. You do the sculpting, the drawing, the conceptual designing, having the understanding of how to kind of create something three-dimensionally in a drawing really helps you into the next step, which would be the sculpting. If you understand it on two dimensions, as you're working in three dimensions, it's a lot easier to push something back or pull something forward. So they really go hand in hand with that. Prosthetics are pretty much used for all the special effects industries. You start out with a life cast, which is a copy of you know somebody's face, whoever it is that you're gonna be making the prosthetic for. Um, and it's a stone copy. And then you'll sculpt the clay over the top of that. And then you'll make a mold, which is a copy of your sculpt, really. I've got a cake mixer, which is for making the foam latex. You gotta whip it up, because it's a, like a four-part batch. Once you pour latex into the mold, you throw it in the oven. Once you take it apart, if you've done everything correctly, your prosthetic should pull out nice and easy. So if you look at movies, some of the main characters have different facial features than what you would expect, or even TV shows like Star Trek. You know, all these different aliens that are up in space, all of those had to be prosthetics. So for the industry, it's a well-utilized tool. Knowing how to paint, you can actually take a bad sculpture and make it look really pretty with just paint. Women do it every day when it comes to beauty makeup. It's uh, called contour and shadowing. <laughs> so uh, it's, uh, it's the perfect example. You have to really understand pigments and skin tones and layers. You don't just use a skin tone base tone and you're done with it. You know, you'll never get the realism of actual skin. Since there's blood flowing through our skin, you start out with a pink tone and then you can go through and put lighter tones over the top of it and then you've got your eye bags or skin imperfections, freckles. So that pretty much just comes down to paint and being able to know what color to use and at what layer to use it at is really the important part as the special effects artist because anybody can just take and throw paint on something but to have it look realistic when it's just a piece of foam is really the trick. I like changing the facial structures um, and body structures because to completely change it and make it look like it belongs there, give them a big jaw or a big nose or you know big ears with big horns or something and to make it look right, it's not easy. My biggest challenge as a special effects artist would pretty much be the concept designing. As a designer you really have to think of certain things like how old is that cut? Is it an infected cut? What kind of a cut is it? You know, is it cut with a knife or is it a gash? What is their skin type like? All those different things that have to be put into the, the design, you know, the very beginning workings of it before you can even sculpt anything, before you can paint it or apply it or anything. As a special effects artist, I challenge myself with making sure that I think of those details before somebody else. I think special effects is just another avenue of art I know that I can sculpt and I can paint and I can do all these things. Well, now I can sculpt something, make it, and then apply it to someone's face, paint it, and create something completely different that'll actually walk around and talk to you and interact with you. And I think that's a valuable skill, especially with computers nowadays. Everybody wants to CG everything with green screens or blue screens or whatever. And to have that practical effects that you can walk up and touch something and you know, be a part of it um, is what I think is really important. There are potential opportunities here in Dayton um, as far as movies and the thing that I'm probably going to try and focus on the most is my own personal art, um, doing my own kind of sculptures and recreating things. Sometimes it's hard, but uh, you make time for it because it's a passion.
filling a stage with dancers isn't all that unusual, but putting musicians up there with them, well, that's a little less common. In Boulder, Colorado, Third Law Dance does just that. Working with the Boulder Chamber Orchestra, the troupe mixes movement with musicianship to great results. Bach Uncaged, what concept did you have in your mind? The first thing I thought about was they're very different. And then we thought, how are they the same? And then we thought that someplace in the middle we would meet. I feel like the notes of both composers kind of floated off of the page and then floated towards each other in terms of the music and the sensibility that we're using with the dancers. The box side has an elaborate quality, I feel like, which goes with the Baroque sensibility of the music. So there are lots of flourishes. There's sort of a more regal carriage. Cage side is a little earthier, much more abstract, a little more neutral in the face, more about stop-start rather than through motion with the movement. Third Law Dance's collaboration with the Boulder Bach Ensemble brings live music and dance together on stage. That's somewhat unique. Musicians when working with dancers are often in an orchestra pit. But Katie Elliott said that separation would not meet the company's needs. So much of what the dancers are pulling from the movement is coming from the music. We start in the studio. Typically, I'm not choreographing to the music that we're going to do the final piece to. So it's very important when we're on stage to have the musicians there with the dancers actually in that collaboration. A lot of what you'll see in the live performance is happening right there. Like they have taken cues off the musicians at that very moment. That give and take, or action and reaction, true to Newton's third law of motion, for which the company is named, dancer Gwen Phillips says, introduces a new dynamic to the piece. It adds a richness and an energy that is not there when the music or the musician is not on stage with you. It's so much fun to be able to look at Zachary, kind of play with him a little bit. He is great at responding, he adds energy, he will change the quality of his music based on how he feels like we're playing with each other and playing with him. Has this project changed the way that you hear either of those artists? Well, yes. Every time I work with dance, the process changes the way that I hear. So what I find thrilling about performing, especially Bach with dance, I'm able to change the course of my phrasing and my timing and even my ornamentation and my embellishments based on what's happening physically with the movement. So the dancers are interpreting the sounds that you hear because I'm responding very much to their movement. Why is the electric violin appropriate for this particular performance? Concerning Bach, the electric violin is perfect for the space because I'm able to tap into the lute-like sounds where you have a bass voice and a middle voice and a treble voice, and they all are in dialogue with one another. So in a way, it's closer to the authentic period instrument of Bach than perhaps a modern violin with metal strings. Unlike an electric violin, the prepared piano was available to Cage. He invented the instrument. It looks a lot like a traditional piano, but screws, bolts, pieces of wood, and other objects attached inside give it a different timbre and resonance. What you're hearing now is not John Cage's music. It's Marsha Shermer improvising on the prepared piano. Generally speaking, Third Law identifies as a contemporary modern dance company. But I would say it's more of a sensibility than it is an aesthetic. It's very innovative, very athletic, very aggressive movement of contemporary dance. It does not look like ballet, though all of our dancers are ballet trained in general. But it's Katie's unique style that we have grown over the last 15 years of our work together. What can art do? Art can save us from becoming a technological society in which uh, people just feel that they're cogs in a machine. We hang a clothesline up for the audience and they can hang their own metaphors on that and then take that away. And maybe it is a healing experience, maybe it riles them up in some way, but I think 
they can do something once they have that expression inside them. That's a very cool piece, but we should point out that Kansas City has its own Bach aria soloists who've also done some pretty interesting things with dance themselves. Their next concert is set for May 6 at the Carbank Building on Shawnee Mission Parkway and State Line. It's a brand new venue for the arts. But our time at this great old venue <laughs> for the arts is just about done. From the Music Hall, I'm Maris Aylward. And I'm Randy Mason. Thanks for watching. Production funding for Arts Upload has been provided in part by Muriel McBrien Kaufman Foundation, Hall Family Foundation, The Hartwig Family, Francis Family Foundation, Richard J. Stern Foundation for the Arts, Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, and by viewers like you. Thank you.